Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Thursday edition, it's Little Friday. And the word at the White House is outrage following, of course, the killing of seven volunteers, aid workers at the World Central Kitchen working for Jose Andres. It really seemed to be, if not a turning point, an inflection point here in the conversation about this administration's policy in Israel when it comes to Israel's war against Hamas and the conduct that we're seeing inside of Gaza. The president today, of course, is going to be meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu Uh, which is our top story right now, as I said earlier, to be a fly on the wall, or I guess a fly on the line. They will not be in the same room, but it is expected that Joe Biden is going to give Benjamin Netanyahu a piece of his mind. The question is, will it matter in the end as we continue to send uh, weapons to Israel? And we're hearing from quarters throughout the Democratic Party here, former Obama officials expressing outrage, allies of the president, like Chris Coons, uh, Senator Van Hollen in Maryland, typically those who are there to express support. And this is a big deal on the campaign trail, which is why we wanted to spend some time with Nia Malika Henderson, who's always writing about the the Biden campaign and this race to the White House for Bloomberg Opinion. She's with us at the table now. Nia, it's great to see you. Thanks for coming in. Um, This is tough when you're hearing from Jon Favreau and you're hearing uh, from allies on Capitol Hill. I can only imagine what Barack Obama tells Joe Biden if they're talking uh, behind closed doors. We're not going to see or hear this meeting today. So what's the job for Joe Biden? Listen, I think it's to express what he's somewhat already expressed, which is outrage at what has happened here with these uh, volunteer workers who are really doing the Lord's work, right? Feeding uh, these folks starvation is an issue in in this area. And you have here a situation where seven are killed uh, by the IDF. They have said this was an accident. You've heard from Jose Andreas, who has said he feels like these aid workers were targeted, uh, which is quite a big claim to make. Uh, And of course, this will be the subject of this conversation that uh, Joe Biden has with Bibi Netanyahu. You know, I think the real question is, as you said, is this sort of a turning point or is it sort of something more subtle, an inflection point? Does this change the conduct of the war uh, from the point of view of the IDF uh, going after Hamas? Uh, Does it change America's support? Uh, You've heard from the White House so far, that it won't, that they will continue to supply arms right. to Israel. And listen, you've heard from people like Bernie Sanders, who's a, you know, obviously a Jewish American, say, does this make Americans complicit, right? This idea that we're funding this war uh, with taxpayer dollars that is ending up killing so many, not only Palestinian uh, civilians, but more recently, uh, this terribly uh, tragic accident where these aid workers were killed. Yeah, and this is making it more difficult now to bring aid. The idea mm-hmm. of a temporary peer yeah. appears to be if not on hold, uh, up in the air because the aid organizations don't have an agreement yet here and they don't want to put their people right. at risk. Remember at one point Joe Biden at the beginning was saying, you know, the way to deal with BB is to hug him, to hold him even closer mm-hmm. at times like these. They've been estranged essentially for months now. Does he need to start hugging him again. Well, listen, you know, that sort of hugging of Bibi, that was their history, right? right. Biden and and Bibi were were close. Uh, And now you hear uh, out of this White House real discontent Mm -hmm. from uh, Biden in terms of uh, Bibi's actions and some in terms of some of his rhetoric. Uh, And some of it has been quite uh, uh, profane in terms of the Mm -hmm. way Biden has referred to uh, Bibi Netanyahu. And we'll see. I'm sure we'll get a readout of this call at some point. But listen, Democrats have been... Sanitized (laughs) readout. Right. No, uh, no curse words. Yeah. But listen, they may share some on this phone call. So that's the kind of conversation we're talking about mm-hmm. here, though. The thing is, politically speaking, like I said, we can't watch or listen. So Joe Biden can't reap the political benefits from that. Right. That he saw borne out again in the polls on another primary night yeah. this week with a protest vote that won't go away. You've written about this. Mm-hmm. Is it getting worse? You know, listen, I think it's certainly not getting any better, right? You've had instances where the White House has tried to reach out to some of these uh, leaders, Palestinian Americans, Arab yeah. Americans, who are sort of at the tip of the spear of this he anti-Biden. Said the deputy director of national security to Michigan for yeah. crying out yeah. loud. That's yeah. serious. Yeah, and he's had one on one meetings with some of these folks. And listen, some of these folks have walked out of meetings. Yeah. Uh, that they've had face-to-face with Joe Biden Mm -hmm. to express their displeasure, to go public with their displeasure, but also to try to get this White House to change course, 
right? To have a ceasefire, to have more um, skin in the game in terms of what BB is doing over there. We have been loyal allies. The U.S. has obviously of Israel throughout this whole thing, yeah. and the elimination of Hamas is their stated goal. And as of now, the U.S. is uh, continuing to support that goal, which means providing uh, arms and ammunition to to mm-hmm. the IDF. As we spend time with Nia Malika Henderson writing for Bloomberg Opinion and the headline today, Mitt Romney should campaign for Joe Biden. Uh, <laughs> this all ties in together here. This is the time in which uh, Joe Biden needs to start to start consolidating here and taking mm-hmm. a general campaign seriously. He's been raising a lot of money. Yeah. But your point is, what happens to these never Trumpers, a lot of whom turned out Nikki Haley pulled 10 Mm percent in all four of those states the other night. But you're looking at folks like Chris Christie, like Mitt Romney, Mm -hmm. even Liz Cheney. Mm -hmm. What world are we in when Liz Cheney could possibly endorse Joe Biden? I mean, this is, you know, she hasn't officially, but she has said she will do everything. And you think Uh, he needs to start asking. I think he. Well, listen, I think. He could start asking at some point. You know, there was a there was a piece in Politico that said yes, he should start asking. My thing is, if these folks are saying that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy, yeah. uh, then that should be enough to make them campaign for Joe Biden. I, I talked to Sarah Matthews, who was somebody who worked in the Trump White House. She uh, was sort of up close and impersonal during the January 6th uh, events and resigned as a result. Hmm. She is anti-Trump, but she's also pro-Biden. And she that? said, listen, she feels like she needs to come out and say she she's going to endorse Joe Biden because yeah. it makes what she says about Trump more real. Is and she palatable. pro-Biden or this is a protest? She, it, it, it's sort of both. It, you know, it? It, it, it's, it's anti-Trump, but yeah. it ends up being Pro Biden, right? Well, she it said does she's, if she yeah, votes she's, for she, No, that's the thing. She yeah. is going to vote for Joe Biden, it, and she's amazing. telling other people uh, that that if they should Chris vote for Joe Christie, Biden. Though, or I mean, the, the, think of the time I that know. they spent dumping on Joe yeah. Biden. That would yeah. be kind of crazy to turn no, around. I, and, I, I think you're exactly right. You know, at, at almost you know, you think about the um, conventions in, in this summer, and, yep. and typically you'll have somebody from the other party mm-hmm. endorse uh, whoever the Republican nominee or the Democratic nominee. Yes, right. Who will that be this go round? Huh. You know, if if I have to guess either Liz Cheney or Chris Christie, I imagine it could be Liz Cheney. That would be uh, monumental. Given the fact that she's out there. You could uh, almost see it happening. I could could see it happen with Liz Cheney, not so much Chris Christie. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So So that's the, remember when Joe Lieberman came out at the McCain? That Mm -hmm. would be the the moment of this convention. Exactly. And so last time for in 2020, it was John Kasich for for, uh, Joe Biden. Mm. You know, we sort Mm. of forget about that convention because it wasn't a traditional convention. It's almost like it didn't happen. It was in a COVID uh, era. And so, so I, I, you know, if I had to put money on it, my mom doesn't like me to bet. But I'm not <laughs> gonna say, I would bet. That's good stuff. I'd bet money on Liz Cheney. We play this back when it happens. Yeah. Um, as for the rest of them, Mitt Romney is another one, mm-hmm. another name out there that seems maybe pliable when it comes to a Biden campaign. I think that's right. You know, again, he has come out and said that he's not going to vote for uh, Donald Trump. Yes. He voted twice to impeach him. He's a man of deep faith. Joe Biden, also a man of, of deep faith. Uh-huh. And I think in that way, he could talk about Joe Biden's faith mm-hmm. uh, and, and and suggest that he would make a better president than, uh, than Donald Trump. Listen, these people need to have a spine. They need to have some skin in the game. If they are, in fact, truly believing uh, that they want to block Donald Trump... Yeah. Yeah. from being president, then the only way to do that really is to, I think, bolster uh, Joe Biden. Well, so then you wonder where do the, where does the endorsement go? And you're talking about yeah. the anti-Trump Republicans mm-hmm. who could vote for Joe Biden, those who held Donald Trump to under 80 yeah. percent, as you write, in the Wisconsin primary mm-hmm. this week. So, OK, you get a Chris Christie or a Mitt Romney. How does that translate to, to people, real voters on the ground? You know, that's the big question. And I think the University of, of, of voters, sort of anti-Trump voters, probably yeah. like 10 percent. And those people were critical in, in but 2020. that's the difference. That's the difference in these states, yeah. right, that are going to be, uh, you know, decided by a couple of thousand votes here mm-hmm. and there. And so this is going to be an all-hands-on-deck election. If you think that Donald Trump should not be anywhere near the White House, as Liz Cheney has said, mm-hmm. then if you're... Chris Christie, if you're Mitt Romney, you need to get on board uh, with Joe Biden and try to help him in some of these states, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, where the, the sort of moderate uh, Republicans, sort yes. of the Chamber of Commerce Republicans are, sure. uh, Mitt Romney, I think Chris yeah. Christie, Liz Cheney can speak to those folks. Do we still call them Lincoln Project Republicans. Maybe that was the last oh, thing. Oh, that's right. I, I, I got to ask you about
about this fundraiser that Trump is talking about? Yeah, thirty million dollars. Th- well, supposedly yes. Says, this is after Joe Biden, you know, pulled twenty five million. I think it was at Radio City. He's yeah. up there on the riser with Bill Clinton, I know, and Barack, yeah, Obama, and Barack Obama, and you know. And Somebody was, was watching and, yeah, from Mar-a-Lago totally. and was so bothered by mm-hmm. this that he had to top it. So there will be a fundraiser. Apparently, this will be at, in Palm Beach. $43 million reportedly on Saturday. He's got all the billionaires lined up. Mm-hmm. The, the criticism here from an actual campaign organizing standpoint is you just front-loaded the whole thing and we're peaking early. You mean for, the, for, for Biden? When it comes to fundraising for, for Donald Trump for Donald in this Trump. case, yeah, yeah. to throw this event, does he, is he helping himself trying to one-up? Joe you Biden? know, listen, I, we'll see what the actual numbers are. Mm-hmm. You know, it literally came out the day that this this uh, fundraiser with uh, with Democrats came out. Yeah. And, you know, Donald Trump says, oh, we're going to have 30 million now and maybe up to 43 million. Sure. We'll see once the FEC reports <laughs> come out how right. much they actually, uh, you know, are able to raise. You know, I think a real problem for uh, Donald Trump is he doesn't have those small dollar donors in the way that he used to that really sure. powered his yep. campaign. They really, I think, spoke to the grassroots energy of it. So he's... He's got his hand out for these uh, billionaires to, mm-hmm. to really try to juice up his campaign, juice up his campaign coffers. Again, he's got all these legal problems. Mm-hmm. Some of that money um, that is raised, quite frankly, is going to go to some of these legal issues that he yeah, has. Yeah. Um, but they need some money. They need a big headline. Yeah. And they need to start spending. They're, they don't have the kind of offices and the sort of ad reach that the Democrats mm-hmm. have had so far. But it's early still. It's, you don't think Lizzo's going? I don't think Lizzo's going to be there. Going I don't think she's going to be Palm there. Beach. All right. No, Lee um, Green, Greenwood might be there. That might be different. Yes, yeah, in yeah. fact, I would expect that. Yeah, with his with Bible. the Bible. Yes, Here you go. Exactly. Uh, don't be a stranger. Nia this Malika Henderson. Speaking of Lord's work, find her column on the terminal and online. It's always a pleasure to see you uh, with us here in the Washington Bureau at Bloomberg. I'm Joe Matthew. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Radio on the satellite and on YouTube, where you can find us right now by searching Bloomberg Global News. Of course, we've been hearing a lot about the border this week, Israel. Israel and the border are following Joe Biden everywhere he goes. Just a couple of days ago, Donald Trump talking about this. Remember the border bloodbath? And referred to prisoners, murderers, drug dealers, mental patients, and terrorists crossing the border on the daily. And we wanted to talk about some of the rhetoric that we're hearing on both sides of uh, this whole story uh, with an expert who has been with us before on the program David Leopold, uh, immigration chair at UB Greensfelder, spent time as general counsel at the American Immigration Lawyers Association. David, it's good to see you. Welcome back. Uh, We understand that the fact is, according to our, at least, government agencies, most people crossing the border are poor families who are trying to escape either poverty or violence. How does that jive with what we're hearing from the former president when it comes to prisoners, murderers, drug dealers, and mental patients? Well, the former president doesn't base anything he says, in fact, on reality. He bases it in terms of how we can rev up his base with hatred and vitriol and all that sort of thing. Look, um, number one, you're right. These are families coming to seek a better life. I'm not judging either way whether we're doing it the right way, but these are families coming to seek a better life in this country for themselves and their children like so many of our parents and grandparents and great grandparents did. So they're 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 fulfilling what America is all about, the promise of of, of a land of opportunity. Um sadly, the Republicans, Donald Trump, who basically that is the Republican Party, have made this into their their issue. They're talking throwing out all kinds of incendiary statements. Um they're ginning up a lot of hatred. They're talking about great replacement theories, which is an anti Semitic mm-hmm. uh, trope. Uh, It's ugly what's going on on the Republican side. Uh, So what's going to happen between now and the election? Uh, David, I wish I had more time with you, but in our our next minute or so, I would love for you to describe to me what the border will look like when people are making up their minds this fall, because the border security compromise that was put together, of course, on Capitol Hill is apparently never going to see the light of day until after the election. Right. Right. And let's remember why. And that's because uh, Donald Trump wanted to use it as a campaign issue. He didn't want to solve the problem. He wanted to yell about the problem. So that's why he ordered the people who wrote the bill, uh, the, the senators who worked closely with the, the, the Republican senators who worked on a bipartisan basis, who wrote the, the, the border bill on immigration, which would have gone a long way towards solving a lot of this. Donald Trump said, no, don't do it. I want to use that as a campaign issue so I can... 
I can spread all my vitriol and hatred. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen, sadly, is you're going to see Donald Trump and the Republican enablers uh, use immigration uh, as a way to, to get their, their base, um, 30% that supports them in this country, upset and angry and, and full of hatred. Uh, on the other side, you'll see Joe Biden talk about his accomplishments and what he's done for the country. David Leopold with UB Greensfelder. Thank you, David, for coming back to see us. I'm Joe Matthew. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Joe and I wishing we could have an ear to the door in the White House right. right now as President Biden speaks by phone with the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. As you mentioned, Joe, it may be some time before we actually get a readout or at least lines from the White House on what exactly it is Biden and Netanyahu discussed today. But we know probably the general gist of what the messaging from the U.S. president to the prime minister will be. Uh, That's for sure. Uh, You made a great point following uh, what happened on Monday. The story just changed. Mm -hmm. Uh, The op-ed from Jose Andres, the, the outcry that we've heard, the outrage that we've heard from progressive Democrats. This was not supposed to be an easy call, and I suspect that it is not. Uh, As we recall, and I mentioned this earlier today, that line from Joe Biden, that when you're having trouble with Benjamin Netanyahu, you hug Hug him him. closer. Uh, And I wonder how much hugging is going on right now for two men who have been largely estranged for the past couple of months. That's why we bring in uh, Ian Marlowe for his take on this. Bloomberg senior reporter covering diplomacy. Uh, Ian is waiting just like we are for a readout on this meeting. I wonder, Ian, your thoughts on what might happen next and whether it leads to a change in policy. That's the big question everyone is asking right now. There's no question that what happened uh, with the World Central Kitchen, that aid workers, the seven of them who were killed uh, in that awful strike um, earlier this week, uh, has changed the sort of tone and dynamic. And I think you've seen that from the Israeli side, Um, you know, apologies from the very highest levels of the Israeli government and the Israeli military apparatus. Uh, Biden coming out saying is outraged, Uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Austin saying much the same. Um, The question, Mm -hmm. though, is does this move the needle really when it comes to conditioning U.S. military support to Israel? And at the moment, uh, you know, everything that we see and hear from the administration seems to be that they're sort of continuing the line here that called for a swift and transparent investigation. Uh, In the past, in the last few months, when we've seen incidents where the U.S. has expressed concern or, uh, you know, even something getting close to condemnation of of strikes that have killed too many civilians or aid not getting in. Uh, We've generally heard, you know, we're concerned. uh, We trust the Israelis to investigate and we're sort of staying the course. Um, What we saw the other week with the U.S., uh, you know, not using their veto at the U.N. to to Mm -hmm. knock down Uh, a a United Nations resolution at the Security Council calling for an immediate ceasefire. That was sort of a sign of how um, strained things have gotten between the U.S. and Israel. Um, But doing something at Mm -hmm. the U.S., at the U.N., which the U.S. immediately came out and said was non-binding and stressed that it didn't really change much, and actually changing, you know, the hard, uh, you know, impact of of military support, which has, you know, been going on for decades, that is cornerstone of the relationship. That's a very big uh, and different change that we're talking about. Yeah, well, Ian, we had a similar conversation yesterday on this program with Jonathan Panikoff of the Atlantic Council. And what he told us was essentially the only leverage the U.S. has over Israel is really big ticket items. It's intelligence sharing. It's F-15s. It's major bombs. That is what foundationally this relationship has historically been built on. And if you were to start conditioning that kind of supply, that would fundamentally change the nature of the U.S.-Israel relationship. Is the fact of the matter here that there's just not really any low-hanging fruit for the U.S. to be using to influence the, the actions of Israel at this point? Yeah, you know, I think, it, and 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 um, Panikov has made the point that you can't go from zero to 25 here. You, you, with this mm-hmm. kind of military aid stuff, it goes straight zero to 60. Do you know what I mean? There's not, there's not many things left that the U.S. can tinker with. I think U.S. officials, you know, you know, believe that they have uh, conditioned and influenced Israel over the course of the conflict. You know, they point to things like 
humanitarian aid getting through uh, in the first place, which was never really a priority for Israel in the early days of the war. I was actually on Secretary uh, Blinken's trip to Israel where they engaged in something like nine hours of negotiations that went until the middle of the night. Um, you know, trying to get the Israelis to let in uh, or agree to let in humanitarian aid in like the early day, weeks of the war. So, they, you know, the U.S. does believe that they have had some influence over Israel since the beginning. But if you're uh, a critic of the administration, if you're a critic of Israel, um, if you're one of the protesters outside, um, you know, some of the embassies uh, or, you know, down in front of the State Department or the White House, you know, looking at, at what's happened since the war began, you know, it's it's kind of cold comfort. I mean, the U.S. says that there's the help with humanitarian aid, but then you see that there's a looming sort of man-made famine, as the U.N. says. Um, you know, there's now more than 30,000 civilians killed, according to the officials um, in the Hamas-run uh, Gaza Strip. And it just kind of looks still that things have gotten worse. Um, and so a lot of people think conditioning military aid is the only thing left. But it does really seem to be uh, a little bit too far for this administration. And they have argued, you know, privately and publicly that that would send a message to Hamas uh, that, that the U.S. is really sort of on the brink of abandoning Israel entirely because the U.S. Mil without U.S. military support, uh, you know, Israel uh, is going to be, you know, Iron Dome missiles to munitions they're using in Gaza. A lot of that stuff would start to fall off and, and suffer sort of, you know, in the near term. Um, and then there's the longer term threats, you know, from Hezbollah, right. Lebanon, and the other Iranian proxies around the region. So there's a lot to think about there. Absolutely. Ian Marlowe, Bloomberg senior reporter covering diplomacy and national security. Thank you so much, as always, for joining us. He, of course, has been following this story so closely, including, as he mentioned, traveling with the Secretary of State Antony Blinken to the region. And it's worth noting, Joe, that it's not just the Middle East where Secretary Blinken has been going or could very well go again in the future. He is expected to make his own trip to China yeah. a few weeks from now after Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. I think this Ian week. was with him on the last one, as a matter <laughs> of fact. And this is, you know, fascinating. Janet Yellen touching down there mm -hmm. this morning. Are we getting into this sort of good cop, bad cop mode with Yellen and Blinken and then, you know, in every quarterly call maybe with Joe Biden? I'm kind of trying to understand the roles that everyone in this administration are playing. Yeah, it's it's an excellent point. I would certainly expect that Janet Yellen in her position as the Secretary of the Treasury and also as a former Federal Reserve Chair will be far yeah. more fo focused on economic issues than maybe some of the geopolitical issues around Taiwan or sure. something else yeah. that the Secretary of State uh, would probably bring. But this is part of just a rotation of cabinet secretaries talking about all of their different issues that pertain to their departments uh, as they make these visits to China. And on mm -hmm. that note, we want to speak with someone who knows China incredibly well. Gary Locke is joining us now. He is former U.S. ambassador to China, also former U.S. Secretary of Commerce. Mr. Locke, thank you so much for being with us. This is, as we've mentioned, Secretary Yellen's second trip in nine months. What tangible could come out of, of this second visit? How much tangible ever comes out of things like this? Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be with you, Joe and Kaylee. And let me just say that uh, this trip by Secretary Yellen is very important in continuing the progress and the momentum of talks between President Biden and President Xi uh, many, many months ago. Uh, we're seeing a thaw in the relationship, and it's, it's critical because we have issues of great contention between the United States and China, but also issues uh, and opportunities of great cooperation, whether it's... Uh, uh, working against uh, North Korea uh, to stop them from developing a nuclear weapon, uh, to finding a cure for cancer, or trying to address climate change. Uh, there are so many areas in which the world is, is expecting partnership and leadership from both the United States and China. But at the same time, we have some very uh, difficult, very hot uh, issues, economic issues, geopolitical issues between the United States and China. So the more dialogue there is between uh, the top leaders uh, top officials of both countries, the greater the progress will be in these areas. Ambassador, we heard uh, from Secretary Yellen on her stopover, her layover in Alaska uh, on the way to China, speaking specifically to our economic relationship, which has been evolving. Listen to what she said, and we'll have you respond. Here she is. We've agreed that it's important to both of us that we don't want to uh, decouple our economies um, we want to continue, and we think we both benefit from trade and investment, but that it needs to be in a level playing field. 
if that was hard to hear, Ambassador, she's talking about not decoupling, as we've heard before, but that it needs to be on a, a, a level playing field. And we're hearing that uh, this administration is carving out space to protect additional new industries like we've seen with high tech chips, for instance. And I wonder to what extent uh, you see that, in fact, leading to a decoupling. Well, there will be some natural decoupling uh, from with countries all around the world and, and uh, involving many different sectors, because uh, as the pandemic demonstrated, no country wants to be overly reliant on supplies, whether it's uh, consumer goods, manufactured goods or medical supplies from another country. Because if there's uh, another pandemic or even a natural disaster, a huge earthquake or political upheaval in another country, we don't want, for instance, uh, 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 companies in America suddenly cut off from so much of what they receive from China, which is why you're seeing a lot of companies, uh, multinational companies, U.S. companies, foreign companies, diversifying their supply chain uh, so that they're not mm -hmm. so reliant on China. So much of what American consumers uh, use every day and purchase every day in their daily lives comes from China, whether it's microwaves, whether it's the tools that they use, clothes and shoes, uh, barbecue sets, you name it, um, much of that comes from China. Uh, so that creates yeah. jobs for the Chinese people. At the same time, China depends very much on American-made goods, including our farm goods, our agricultural goods. China is America's largest agricultural export destination outside of uh, Canada uh, or outside of North America. And so our farmers depend on selling their soybeans and their wheat and their apples and their cherries uh, to China, along with Boeing. Uh, Boeing's uh, uh, number one, uh, uh, most of Boeing airplanes are sold to carriers around the world, including China. So our economies are intertwined, and which is which is why Secretary Yellen is saying we don't want a complete decoupling, but companies, whether Chinese companies or American companies, are beginning to diversify, diversify their supply chain to include other parts mm -hmm. of the world. Well, as we talk about the supply that comes from China, Ambassador, one of the things we know that the Treasury Secretary is going to be talking about specifically is industrial overcapacity and the way that that can be manipulated in terms of supply and demand to affect pricing or access uh, to certain things that China is producing. When she goes and airs those concerns, how likely is it that China is going to receive those and say, OK, yes, you're right, we will we will be changing our behavior on that front? Isn't it to China's advantage to continue that kind of overcapacity in production? Well, China is trying to uh, jumpstart their economy coming out of the pandemic uh, by offering subsidies and government incentives uh, for industrial output. Uh, certainly, they are mm -hmm. leading the world in terms of the manufacturing of um, electric automobiles and the battery technology that goes with electric uh, uh, automobiles and buses, uh, and also in the solar uh, area. But if they do so uh, by uh, uh, stimulating or, or having too much capacity, uh, dumping uh, their, their uh, products into the world, flooding the world with their products mm -hmm. and driving prices down, that's going to actually destabilize the economies and sectors in many other countries, including here in the United States, with uh, some of the Infrastructure uh, and Inflation Reduction Act incentives to bring manufacturing back to America, especially in the solar, uh, clean energy area. Uh, that will disrupt and undercut many of the efforts that America and other countries have embarked upon, uh, which will lead to perhaps retaliatory measures against Chinese companies or dumping unfair subsidies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, that will upset the world trade relationship and it will cause problems for China itself. So I think the message from Secretary Yellen is, uh, yes, you want to be the world's leading supplier of uh, electric automobiles and battery technology and solar equipment, but you have to do it yeah. on a level playing field. Uh, and that I think that's the key message there. Otherwise, there will be repercussions, not just by the United States, but by other countries around the world. Uh, and that yeah. can also, in the long term, hurt China. Spending time here on Bloomberg TV and radio with Gary Locke, the former U.S. ambassador to China. We want to let our audience know uh, that we've just received word from the White House that President Biden's meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu has come to a close. Ambassador, I know it's not what you're here to talk about today, but in our last moment, and I don't want to set you up to cut you off here, but what does China think about America's involvement in the Middle East? Well, uh, China... Um 
is watching very carefully to see how the United States responds, along with how the United States responds uh, to uh, Russia's uh, invasion and military action uh, in the Ukraine, and what the West does. Uh, does the West really back up its allies? Uh, does it, um, uh, will it uh, live up to its word of guarantee? Because otherwise, uh, yeah. uh, there are many countries in uh, the South Pacific, in the, uh, in the Pacific region, where the United States has mm -hmm. pledged uh, protection and defense. Um, and, uh, and Beijing uh, and, is watching. Ambassador, thank you. I wish we had more time with you. Come back and talk to us again. Gary Locke, of course, as well, the former governor of Washington, former U.S. Secretary of Commerce. I'm Joe Matthew with Kaylee Lines in Washington. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. And Joe, the fact that it is Thursday puts us now three days out since the death of seven humanitarian aid workers working for World Central Kitchen in Gaza, killed by Israeli strikes. And just a day, at, so we're two days out now from a primary in which voters expressed their displeasure, protest voted against President Biden in a number of states, choosing uncommitted or uninstructed, as the case may be, because they are dissatisfied with the way that he has handled this conflict and perhaps uh, his re relationship with the Israeli government. And of course, speaking of the Israeli government, the president was just speaking with the prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, and sources the White House say that call has now wrapped up. We just don't know yeah. what exactly was said. It's probably going to take a minute uh, for us to figure that out. But the political stakes are not new for this president. And now that we're hearing from Biden allies, from members of the Obama administration, all criticizing uh, the policy that this administration has taken, it does make you wonder what happens from here. If this is an inflection point, what does it lead to? So we assemble our panel. Jeannie Shanzano is with us, Democratic analyst and Bloomberg politics contributor, today joined by Chapin Fay, Republican strategist at Actum. Great to have you both back with us, Jeannie. Joe Biden has an opportunity here with this meeting. How does he use it to leverage this to his advantage? Yeah, I mean, I think we got a preview of that last night with Austin's call um, with the Israeli uh, defense minister. Um, it was apparently heated. I think Biden is going to say exactly the same thing. Outrage at what happened, need to investigate, need to protect, protect rather aid workers and civilians, need to wait to go into Rafa. Um, politically here, I think the White House is thinking this readout will show how angry Joe Biden is by what has happened and how he is expressing that to the prime minister. I'm not sure it is going to be effective though. And I worry about a very, very mixed message that Joe Biden is sending, and I don't think it is helping him politically at home. Well, we did just get a statement from the White House officially. It just says President Biden spoke with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel today to discuss the latest developments in Israel and Gaza. A readout of the call will be issued soon. So, of course, we'll provide you the details when we have them. That statement in and of itself doesn't really hint at much that went on in this conversation. But when we talk about the political difficulty of this for Biden, knowing that many in the Democratic Party, Chapin, are unhappy with his handling of it, it's worth noting that we are starting to see really a divide in which Republicans are incredibly pro-Israel, not to say that President Biden is, is not, but have been much more vocal about it, critical of potentially any criticisms that the Biden administration is providing to Israel. Could that also play in politically to some of these more vulnerable Republicans in places like New York and districts that Biden won? Could could the Israel policy be weighing on them as well, just as we're seeing it weigh on the incumbent president? It could. Um, and while I, you know, I can't speak for every district around the country, um, there are certain uh, marginal districts here in New York where there are very high Jewish populations and also very high mm -hmm. um, Arab and Muslim populations. Um, so it, it could cut both ways. Um, I think there are probably a larger Jewish population is the way uh, redistricting has worked out in some of these districts, uh, you know, particularly on Long Island, I'm thinking about. Um, so it certainly could have an effect. Um, and and while I did say earlier, it 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 it, it doesn't cleanly divide on uh, partisan lines. You're 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 right. Um, support for Israel in general has always been, um, you know, a, a more Republican issue, if you will, uh, the Democrats. Um you know, and, you know, what 
what I'd like to say about this meeting is um, I don't know why we're holding Israel to a standard higher than we hold uh, ourselves and the rest of the world. Right. It was an absolute tragedy what happened. Um, but I think it's important to remember that every tragedy that happened subsequent to October 7th uh, is because of October 7th. Right. And mm. um, we've heard people talk about you know, Israel's reaction and what you know, the president wants them to do. They have already admitted the mistake. They have apologized. They have said they would do their own inquiry. And they've already said that they're going to adjust tactics. I don't even remember when America has said that. Right. Meanwhile, there are still hostages in Gaza, children, women, mm -hmm. women being sexually assaulted, senior citizens. This is, was a terrorist attack where people parachuted in and killed and raped kids having fun at a rave. So I think it's important to remember that. And, you know, the question of why are we holding Israel to a higher standard? I think we know the answer. Um, but, I'm, you know, I, I very strongly believe that Israel has a right to defend itself, just like everyone does. And one side is following, you know, trying to follow the rules of engagement in Geneva Conventions. And the other side is allowed to do whatever it wants. Uh, and Israel gets criticized for it. So I'm sorry for the little aside, but I think it's important to have that voice here in this conversation. I'm glad you said that, uh, Chapin. And let's talk about it a little bit more, Jeannie. Is the U.S. holding Israel to a higher standard when it continues to supply 2,000 pound bombs? Yeah, this is the problem for Joe Biden, right? Just politically, is that you? we are hearing um, on the ground a mixed message from Joe Biden, and it is a problem for him. Because what is he saying? On the one hand, he is saying by one side of his mouth that Jill Biden, Chris Coons, Van Hall and others are telling him to stop the war. He has um, yet to take on Jose Andres' uh, you know, suggestion that Israel deliberately targeted these seven aid workers. And on the other hand, to your point, we are still supplying arms. So just politically speaking at home, that message is ringing very hollow. We had a primary in New York yesterday. I just talked to a few people. We don't have an uncommitted option on our line, but you can leave a blank ballot. And many people I've talked to did. I, I, I'm not sure it's anywhere near what we saw in Wisconsin, but this is the political problem for Joe Biden. So even setting aside the question of whether we are holding Israel to a higher standard, he can't have it both ways. And this is going to be a problem for him at home. Well, and we know, Chapin, that Netanyahu also is facing some difficulty at home. It was just this past weekend where there were thousands of protesters on the streets calling for new elections. And now Benny Gantz in the Israeli government is also calling for an early election in September. We tend to just talk about Israel here and, and what perhaps Israel is seen doing wrong or, or not doing wrong in defending itself. Is this Israel or should we really be talking about Netanyahu and this the specific Israeli government? Well, that is a, a phenomenal point. And I, I wish I had brought it up earlier. You're 100 percent right. This is not about Palestinian people and Israeli people. This is about their two governments or whatever you want to call Hamas. Right. That's what this is about. Those are the two actors making these decisions. So I do think, you know, while I am a firm you know, supporter of Israel's right to defend itself, I am all for protests. I'm all for people voicing their opinions. And if Netanyahu loses, uh, you know, that's for the Israeli people to decide in their elections and the way their, you know, parliamentary system works. You know, if if they lose confidence and there's a new election, you know, so be it. That's politics. That's democracy. And that's the way it's supposed to work. Right. And if mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a pro ceasefire politician is elected to lead them, then that's what they've decided. And, you know, I'll support that decision, too. Right. Um, because it's the, dem you know, it's a democratically elected uh, government. So I do think we do need to distinguish. Right. You know, I just sort of went in on defense of Israel. But that's not to say the Palestinian people are not suffering. They are certainly suffering under Hamas. Mm -hmm. And it's really Hamas is really where the ire should be going. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the problems in this country, uh, especially on the protests, is it's uh, the Jewish people or Israeli people versus, you know, uh, Palestinian people and their supporters. And that's really not what it should be about. It should be about the leadership and 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 their governments. And that happens too, right? People disparage Trump supporters and people disparage Biden supporters. It really shouldn't be like that. Mm -hmm. But that's where sort of the world is headed. A great conversation today with our panel, Chapin Fay and Jeannie Shanzano. Jeannie, following this call, Progressive Democrats on Capitol Hill are going to listen very closely and they're going to parse the words of the readout that is forthcoming from the White House. Should conditions be attached to future weapons shipments to Israel? 
that's what I think we are hearing more and more. I mentioned Chris Van Hollen as an example of that. I think things are getting shaky in the Democratic side in the Senate on this issue. There is widespread concern. And so I do think that is what we are going to be hearing as next week rolls around. Um, because again, you are hearing this on the ground. And I know we like to describe it as sort of a progressive left is where this is started from and that is true but i can tell you that it is spreading like wildfire through the democratic base that's why joe biden is rightly so concerned about the politics of this and saying things like the first lady supports a ceasefire um that is a message to tell you how he is hearing this but again i think his messaging on this is leaving him open to some real challenges as we move into this convention this summer if we don't see a ceasefire beforehand. Ultimately, he's in an impossible position, you know, selling right. weapons, uh, supporting Israel, but also trying to get the war stuff. He's in an impossible position. Wow. Yep, tough indeed. Chapin Fay and Jeannie Shanzano, our political panel today. Thank you both so much for joining us. Political discourse at its best, Joe. Yeah, it's important with, to consider all sides of this issue, but yes, both saying that President Biden is in a tough spot here. For sure. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We have the latest from the White House. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, this is the readout we were waiting for, Kaylee, on the meeting between Joe Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu. I'm kind of amazed it came out this quickly, knowing how long it has taken in the past with meetings with President mm -hmm. Xi and others, for instance. Uh, look, let's cut to the chase here. This is a longer readout. The president calling for specific, as I read directly from the readout here, specific, concrete, and measurable steps to address civilian harm, humanitarian suffering, and the safety of aid workers remembering, of course, the killing of those volunteers with World Central Kitchen. It goes on to write, the president made clear U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action on these steps. So we've set up the next chapter here, Kaylee, but it has yet to be written. Yeah, and we also understand per this readout that Biden underscored that an immediate ceasefire is essential to stabilize and improve the humanitarian situation and protect innocent civilians. Mm -hmm. President Biden, it goes on to say, made clear that the United States strongly supports Israel in the face of threats, including um, from Iran and the Israel, uh, Iranians threatening the Israeli people. So still yeah. they're expressing support for Israel, is, even as we are seeing Fascinating. a directive, essentially, from the president to take the steps that the U.S. thinks are necessary mm -hmm. in this moment. So we want to turn now to Hadar Suskinen. He, and he is Americans for Peace president and CEO. He also was a sergeant first class in the Israeli Defense Forces. It are great uh, to have you with us as we're just understanding uh, what exactly it is President Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu talked about today. Will Netanyahu heed the words that Biden spoke to him when he's talking about the idea that Israel needs to make changes here? Do you have faith that those changes will happen? Well, that is the big question. And first of all, again, thank you both for having me on with you today. You know, what we've been seeing in this back and forth between Netanyahu and his government and the Biden administration for months now is Biden and, and colleagues speaking out, pushing, urging for more restraint, calling for ceasefires, taking various steps, pushing in that direction. And we've seen Netanyahu and his government absolutely failed to heed that. And so the question at the moment is, what is that next unwritten chapter that you were referencing? You know, Biden and the American administration, we have leverage. It is not a theoretical. It's not just asking uh, pretty please or asking for a favor. The United States supports Israel not only politically and theoretically, but concretely. We continue, as of yesterday, to send arms to Israel that are being used directly in Gaza. And so the question is going to become, when is President Biden going to move from saying what he thinks needs to happen to taking the steps that he can take to make it so. Hmm. I wonder, uh, as we talk about this, you actually have been there in the IDF, which is known for its ability to strike with precision. We can talk to the Iranians about that after what happened in Damascus this week. Are we to believe 
that the IDF is simply incapable of controlling uh, the outcome of its strikes, or that, in fact, Netanyahu and his military leaders have been indiscriminate? Can, in fact, we see a more responsible handling of the weapons that we're providing? There's no doubt that you could see that. Um, and what we've seen are a range of things. So what happened with the World Central Kitchen workers, um, you know, that tragedy was three missiles fired, um, you know, fired at three different vehicles. Um, Netanyahu and the IDF have claimed it was a mistake, not an accident, mm -hmm. right? They are claiming that a commander in the field did so without authorization. There's no question that he did so intentionally because he thought there was a Hamas operative there and made that decision. And we've seen that there was a report in 972 magazine um, about the the AI software that they call Lavender, which has been used to target Hamas operatives and the way in which Israel has, for this war, changed the rules of engagement, broadening them from what the Israeli military itself referred to as targeted assassinations of only senior Hamas uh, leaders to include more junior leaders and include more leeway and leniency in what they consider the acceptable number of civilian casualties to go along with targeting Hamas targets. So there isn't a question that this is some sort of accident or something out of their control that's happened that they just don't have the capacity. This is a political policy decision about how to, um, you know, how to uh, make the rules and take the actions of this war. And it rests with Netanyahu. Well, when you talk about the the calculation of just how many civilians they're willing to see die if it if it helps them accomplish their objectives, it raises the question of Rafa. When we have heard from Netanyahu that they plan for the Israeli army to move more than a million Palestinians who have sought refuge in that city in southern Gaza out, get them aid before going in to attack the remaining Hamas battalions there. Is that credible? Do you really believe the IDF can do that? Or are they going to do so knowing that there's a certain amount of losses that they're willing to tolerate? Well, it's very hard to imagine that they can do so in any way that we in the United States or most of the world would consider acceptable. Um, and I will say, by the way, you know, you, you talked about the IDF. The IDF is the arm. They are the implementers mm -hmm. of this. These are all political sure. decisions. Again, rest with Netanyahu, rest with the government. And, you know, I think it's very hard to imagine where and how they could move those people. Um, Netanyahu has, of course, not been clear and he's intentionally not been clear about where they're going to move those people. There are people in his government, people like Smotrich and Ben Gavir, who are calling for those people to be moved to the Sinai, to Egypt. Um, which, again, moving people out of an occupied territory forcefully is a war crime. Um, obviously, going through and uh, indiscriminately bombing them is a war crime as well. So it's very hard to imagine any way in which is Israel could initiate a large-scale invasion of Rafah that would not be uh, disastrous, frankly. What about ceasefire talks? Should I even be asking you about that right now? Look, you should, because we need to get there. We, we, we have to, to get to that, right? This war has gone on um, longer than it should have in the first place. If you look at uh, polling among the Israeli public, remarks from most Israeli political leaders, um, people there believe very deeply, and I share that belief, that Prime Minister Netanyahu is continuing this war for his personal purposes, for his political viability, for the continuation of his government. He's announced that, yes, of course, there will be investigations into what happened on October 7th, into the response of the military, the response of the government. But he keeps claiming that none of that can happen during wartime, of course. So we have to wait until after the war to do that. And everyone is waiting for after the war. They're waiting for that for elections. They're waiting for that for accountability. Mm -hmm. And so he has every incentive in the world to keep this going, even when his stated war aims are clearly unachievable. The idea that one can militarily eliminate Hamas is not based in reality. Whatever d damage could possibly be done, and it has been done, to their military capacity, you know, has happened in six months of intense bombing, in six months of intense mm -hmm. invasions. It is certainly not giving Israel any greater security right now to continue this. And look, the vast majority of people in Israel, and I think many people here, you know, believe that a military response, unfortunately, was necessary 
following Hamas's horrific attacks on October 7th. Mm. Hamas cannot be allowed to do that again. Israel has not only the right, but the fundamental responsibility of any government is to protect its people. And so they should be doing that. But they failed in that responsibility on October 7th, and they continue to fail by prosecuting a war that is not based in protecting the security of its people. It's based in the ongoing political survival of Netanyahu. Well, to that exact point, Hadar, and you make up an excellent point about how you can take out the military capacity of Hamas, but how do you defeat an ideology in and of itself if this is a designated terrorist organization by uh, many countries? But to the point about the kind of political calculation here for Netanyahu, we have seen just in the last 24 hours, Benny Gantz calling for early elections in September. We saw the thousands of protesters taking the streets to call uh, for the same or just days ago over this past weekend, how should we be thinking about how Netanyahu is likely to respond to those kind of domestic pressures? That Does that only double make him double down more rather than listening p- perhaps to the voices of those dissenters? But, you know, those protests started last year, of course, before the war. Right, sure, with, with the judicial, judicial reform. Crew. Right, and there were hundreds of thousands of people out on the streets. They were stopped by the war Um, mostly because people were in the war. They were in reserve duty. It was also impossible to gather safely in large numbers. Um, They've come back. The numbers have not quite reached the pre-October levels yet, but they're getting there. And the intensity is, frankly, much higher because now you have dual movements of people calling for the government to prioritize the release of the hostages, which many, many, many people feel they have not done, and people calling for new elections, and a group that is smaller but growing also calling for the end of the war. And so those are very important. The challenge is, even if you had, you know, a million people, two million people out in the streets, the only way to bring down the government, literally, technically, before its term is up, is for a vote of no confidence by those in the government. So Gantz and Eisenkot, his colleague, personally, I believe they shouldn't be in this government anymore. They went in under a national unity idea saying we have to help. We want to impact how this war is being waged. Um, I I don't know what they think, but I certainly don't think they've had a lot of impact on that. Uh, I think they should leave the government. That's not sufficient to bring it down. They would still have 64 members. And the challenge is that those members in the government know that the likelihood is they are going to get wiped out in the next election. They're not going to be in the next government. So there's a disincentive for them to go to new elections, not only Netanyahu, but all of his partners. But there are a variety of forces, some related to the war, some related to the issue of the draft of the ultra-Orthodox who are currently exempt from military service that have the potential to crack this government. And so the public pressure is very important. The international pressure is even more important. People in Israel are very finely attuned to what President Biden is saying, what Senator Schumer said, what other American political leaders here have had to say. And they understand that Netanyahu has done something no American or no Israeli leader has ever done before, which is really, truly, deeply lose the confidence of American political leadership. And that's very damaging for him. Hadar, we were looking forward to talking with you. He's the CEO of Americans for Peace, former Sergeant First Class in the IDF, Hadar Suskin. Many thanks. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.